The last thing I want to talk about is policy learning. In this lecture so far, we worked in a setting with features X, outcomes Y, treatments W, potential outcomes, and we wanted to estimate in this setting the conditional average treatment effect. Policy learning is a problem that's in the same setup, except instead of asking what does the conditional average treatment effect look like, instead of asking you to describe the treatment effect function, what policy learning asks you to do is to be prescriptive, to actually make recommendations about who should be treated and who should not be treated. So specifically, a treatment assignment policy pi is a mapping from your feature space X to a recommendation zero or one, given your features, should I send you to treatment or, or should I send you to control? And the problem of policy learning is to use data to find a good policy of this type. Now, the problem of policy learning and the problem of Kate estimation are obviously very closely related, but there are some subtle but crucial differences. One important difference is the end goal. The end goal of Kate estimation is to accurately estimate tau of x. The goal of policy learning is to learn a policy that achieves high welfare. That is, when you deploy it, it makes the right recommendations for people, um, so, so you get high rewards on average. Uh, if you're trying to do policy learning, and as a byproduct, you get an accurate estimate, a reasonably accurate estimate of tau of x, but this doesn't help you make good decisions, then in terms of the goals of policy learning, uh, that's not of much use. So the last thing I want to talk about in this lecture uh, is to introduce uh, formalize the problem of policy learning and then to say a few words about how to learn good policies in um, a loss-based uh, machine learning setup. The assumptions are the same as always, so I'm not going to go through them in more detail. The, the interesting thing, though, and the thing that's new is this notion of a policy that maps, again, x to 0 or 1. And then the associate notion of a value of a policy. The value of a policy is an answer to the question, if I sampled everyone IID, then when I see your covariates xi, I send you to treatment arm pi of xi. If pi of xi comes out 0, I send you to control. If pi of xi um, comes out 1, I send you to treatment. And the value of a policy measures what would be the average outcome under the sampling design where I assign treatment according to the policy pi, or equivalently, I get to see the potential outcome that's the one chosen by the policy. So writing down the value of the policy, it's very simple. It's just the expectation of the potential outcome chosen by pi. Uh, there's a lot kind of packed into this notation though. Uh, so if this seems uh, confusing at first, it may make help. It may make sense to just like meditate on it for a few minutes to kind of you know, understand what this notation is doing. But so anyways, we're gonna assume here that outcomes are good, uh, outcomes wise, you'd want to get uh, higher rather than lower values of y. Um, and so uh, the goal is gonna, going to be to find a policy to make v of pi, that makes v of pi large. So in order to kind of get more intuition about this problem, uh, one helpful thing to notice is that you can write the value of a policy, um, v of pi, as in two parts, expectation of yi zero, that is just the average outcome you'd get from the the average outcome in the control arm, or equivalently, the value of a policy who sends everyone to control, uh, plus a second term expectation of tau of x times pi of x, uh, which is essentially sa says how does the uh, value of your policy change due to the fact that you send some people to treatment. Uh, this formula is intuitive, right? The value of a policy is the value of doing nothing plus the value of doing something as recommended by your policy. But something we immediately see from this 
is that essentially you'll get high utility out of a policy um, if you treat people who have a large treatment effect. So, and otherwise here, if you just wanted to have the largest outcome possible, um, the optimal policy pi would treat people with a positive treatment effect uh, and not treat people with a negative treatment effect. Um, if you have some cost of treatment or a budget constraint, then still you'll see that kind of, in a lot of generality, the optimal non-parametric treatment assignment policy pi would just threshold uh, on uh, tau of x, threshold at c. So your optimal policy would be of the form pi of x is indicator tau of x is bigger than c. So at first glance, uh, this reduction might really make it seem that there's nothing much uh, to policy learning beyond Kate estimation. But again, the more you look at it, the more there is. Um, the first point is that, okay, it's true that non-parametrically, the optimal policy is one that thresholds uh, tau at C. This doesn't mean that the optimal thing to do with data is to first learn a Kate estimate tau hat and then have your policy threshold tau hat. Uh, why? Well, so far we've talked about um, ways of estimating tau of x that essentially try to get estimate tau of x as accurately as possible under squared error loss. But actually squared error loss for tau of x is not necessarily the correct loss function for really kind of emphasizing the objective we care about in policy learning. The second point, uh, so the first point is statistical. Uh, the second point um, is more practical, but also very important. It's that as soon as we move away from just describing the data to actually recommending action, there are a larger number, or there's a large number of things we need to take into consideration that weren't there before. Um, for example, is your policy gameable? Uh, there might be some features X that you observe in your data, but you know that if you start using them for decision rule, then people will just start gaming their features um, and that'll break your policy. So you wouldn't want to use those. Um, another important one is, is it legal or ethical to use some variables X uh, in your policy? I'm gonna show, I'm gonna return to the gain example later on um, and talk about kind of optimal policies, um, utility maximizing policies uh, for prioritization eligibility to, to the welfare to work program. And this is a setting. We have gender in the data set. Does tau of x vary with gender? It may or may not. It's not up to you, right? When you're just describing the data, you should just try to describe the data as accurately as possible. But then when it comes to actually recommending eligibility for the program, you're not allowed to discriminate based on gender. So your policy pi should not use gender as a variable in determining um, who gets access to the program or not. So this is again, uh, another dimension. Th this wasn't a statistical consideration. This was more a consideration saying that yes, non-parametrically, the optimal policy will be one that uh, thresholds on Kate, uh, but just thresholding on tau of x, it might, given the variables x in your data set, uh, may not be a feasible policy or may not even be a legal policy. Uh, so you want to learn policies pi that kind of satisfy constraints uh, that are required by the application. So, all right, how are we gonna do this? Uh, given the theme of this uh, lecture, hopefully. Uh, it's pretty clear. Uh, the goal is to come up with a loss function for policy uh, learning and then to learn using this loss function. Uh, what the loss function should be is pretty clear. We want to find welfare maximizing policies. So our loss is going to be negative welfare uh, 
or we could just out here try to make all, all the machine learning procedures be argmen over the loss. But you could also think of machine learning as doing argmax uh, over estimated welfare. And that's uh, entirely fine also. So that's what we're going to want to do. And the, the big question is just how can we design a loss function that is feasible in terms of the data that we can optimize and use for learning. And when you first see this, this might seem tricky, um, but it actually, there's a very nice solution. Um, the first thing you can do that's very simple, uh, uh, it's uh, nicely discussed in this paper by Kitagawa and Tetanov. Um, what they notice is that you can actually get a very simple uh, estimate of the value of a policy via inverse propensity weighting. And how is this going to go? Well, we want to estimate the average reward if we were to give everyone treatment according to policy pi. Well, what this is going to do, uh, IPW policy evaluation is going to do, um, is it's going to look at all samples for who treatment matches the policy. If treatment doesn't match the policy, then uh, IPW won't consider them. And then it'll just take an average of the outcomes for all samples where kind of the treatment actually matched your policy pi. Uh, but of course, you're going to be missing some samples. So you need to kind of correct for your sampling bias, like an average treatment effect estimation. And you do this by kind of um, inverse propensity weight. Uh, you can check that if the propensity scores or kind of the probability that wi is equal to pi of xi is known, uh, then this inverse propensity weighted value estimate b hat pi is unbiased for the true v pi. So this is, a, this is a reasonable value estimate. And then a machine learning approach might just kind of take this v hat, v hat pi that we got out of this IPW construction, and then learn pi hat by just maximizing over v hat pi in a machine learning sense. So in some sense, uh, you can just do that. Um, in another sense, what's interesting is that this objective function is actually quite different from the type of objective functions we've worked with before. Before, kind of in prediction, we worked with squared error loss. And for estimating Kate's, uh, we worked with the R loss, which is essentially like a modified recentered squared error loss. Um, so learning always amounted to kind of going down a quadratic looking objective uh, with some regularization. Here, it looks very different. So what's going on here is we have, right, we're optimizing over policies pi. And the policy pi, the way it enters into this value function is kind of through all the recommendations you make at the samples i up to n. So I only care about the policy pi based on does it recommend 0 or 1 at all my training samples, and then Based on this, kind of, if pi matches wi, then I get a weighted version of wi into uh, my sample. Otherwise, I don't. And this kind of, um, I'm, I'm not going to say much about this here, other than um, actually carrying out learning with this kind of 0, 1 type uh, decision rule um, is very different kind of algorithmically than carrying out learning uh, with a squared error loss type objective. And the, solving this problem is actually very closely related. It's formally equivalent to solving a weighted classification pro problem. You could qualitatively think uh, that what you're trying to do is you're trying to conceptually classify people into the correct um, treatment arm. 
this is not quite true, but in terms of the optimization routine, it looks a lot like that. Uh, so, and, and one example of this is that if you want to try this, uh, we have this package policy tree um, that actually solves this objective over the space of trees. Uh, so, and then you can, uh, if, if you're curious about um, the details of how this reduces the classification problem, um, we also go into it more uh, in, in that package, uh, in, in the package documentation. So this is IPW, uh, things work nicely. Inverse propensity weighting gives you, when the propensity scores are known, a nice unbiased estimate of the value of a policy that you can optimize uh, over, say, the space of decision trees. Um, and this uh, gives you a nice way of learning policies. Uh, is there anything left to be said? Uh, well, so far in this class, uh, I've generally not let you stop at the point where you had an algorithm that worked well when propensity scores were known. Um, in an observational study, you might worry, what if these propensity scores are not known? So you need to estimate them. And you could, of course, try running IPW with estimated propensity scores here, but that wouldn't be particularly robust. Can we do anything else? Um, well, remember last time we saw IPW, it was for average treatment effect estimation. And then we realized that there was a double robust alternative to IPW, that was AIPW. AIPW had these nice robustness properties uh, where it could recover from uh, propensity scores that weren't uh, perfectly estimated. And this uh, gave you better properties for average treatment effect estimation. It turns out that in policy learning, the same thing is true. Um, these things here, uh, these are what's called double robust scores. Um, if you remember what AIPW does, AIPW um, estimates the average treatment effect by taking the average of these uh, gamma hat eyes. So I'll just write it down here to be specific. Uh, tau hat AIPW is equal to one over N sum I equals one up to N of gamma hat I where the gamma hat i's are just the things we had before. Um, it turns out if you want to do double robust policy learning, what you can do is you build these same double robust scores. Um, and then uh, you set up an, obje uh, an objective um, much like before, um, except now you can think of what this is doing is you try to classify people into treatment or control. Here I centered this, so this thing here is plus one if you're treated and minus one if you're sent to control. And what this um, uh, welfare objective measure does here, it essentially there are these double robust scores, which are noisy proxies for the treatment effect you get for treating the ith person. And essentially, if I send you to treatment, I earn that double robust score. If I send you to control, then I pay that double robust score and a good policy would be one that's usually one in regions of feature space where treatment effects are positive. So gamma hat eyes are on average going to be positive. And the policy sends people to control and has this thing be negative one in regions of feature space where gamma hat i is usually negative. So uh, again, um, this is also implemented in uh, policy treatment. So just to see this in uh, action, I'm gonna go back to the gain study we talked about earlier. And here, we're just gonna do this. I'm gonna form the same double robust scores as before. And then the way we're gonna learn policies is by maximizing this objective. Um, we need to somehow regularize. And here, the way I'm gonna regularize is I'm gonna tell you your decision rule can be any depth k tree. I'm going to try k equals 1 and k equals 2. So essentially, I'm going to ask my algorithm to just kind of look over the space of all the trees um, of depth k and then see which one maximizes my estimated welfare objective um, I have here. 
um, that's all we're going to do. And then I'm going to deploy that tree. And if we run it here, uh, then this is the output you get. Kind of a lot of math and non-parametric statistics went into producing this tree. Um, but the outcome is uh, that in the gain study we talked about earlier, uh, the best depth to tree um, uh, the, the, or what we, what we claim is kind of in terms of welfare, a depth to, through, a depth to tree that's essentially as good as any depth to tree can be is the following. It first looks, um, was a person paid uh, three quarters ago? Uh, if yes, uh, you treat them if they're a high school graduate. If no, you treat them if they have children. All right. This is a recommendation um, that, uh, okay, the claim is that from a utilitarian perspective, um, this does a very good job um, alloc allocating um, treatment to those who are going to be most responsive to it. Some comments, uh, like I mentioned earlier, when you're uh, making policy recommendations, there are, of course, things you're not allowed to do. Um, here, we had data on race and gender um, in the data set, but given that you're not allowed to, and it wouldn't be ethical to um, discriminate based on these, um, we just forbid the tree from splitting on uh, race or gender. Um, there are other things that are going on here. We're looking at, uh, do the people have children in choosing whether to treat them or not? Is that okay? Um, I think at some point, uh, it's not up to kind of statisticians, econometricians uh, uh, to, to decide. Uh, it's up to the kind of stakeholders to see whether this is a decision rule or they're okay with or not. And one thing I like about this kind of policy learning over the space of trees approach is that in the end, your recommended policy is a very simple tree that hopefully even people without uh, mathematical training can engage with. Uh, so then you don't need to kind of in the abstract have an opinion about whether this tree uh, is a deployable policy or not in terms of fairness criteria. You can just go ask stakeholders uh, whether they like it or not uh, and then take it from there. Uh, you might also ask, uh, is the is, the, is this policy uh, any good or not? Um, and here, of course, what criterion are we going to use uh, for um, assessing uh, the quality of the fit? Well, of course, we're going to just uh, use our estimated welfare um, as a criterion as as the criterion. So we're going to do some kind of cross validation type stuff where we're going to kind of on one part of the data try to learn a policy. And then on another uh, part of the data, evaluate which what is the average value of this policy, and pick the policy that does well um, in terms of um, evaluation on this loss. And here uh, you see that essentially learning in terms of depth to trees, uh, the the picture I showed you uh, earlier um, in terms of out of sample. Uh, or kind of cross-validation type evaluation on the welfare metric uh, does well relative to everything else. So you notice there are two columns here. In the left column, I'm kind of working in the same regime I talked about earlier, where I pooled the four um, small experiments into one, um, and then just kind of tried to estimate propensity scores. So this is an evaluation of how well we're doing in terms of the estimated propensity scores. Um, on the right here, I cheated and I went and kind of brought back the true randomization probabilities in order to get uh, an objective assessment and actually check that yes, uh, this policy is kind of uh, measurably better than random uh, in a way that we can uh, validate by looking at the true randomization probabilities. Anyways. I went very quickly here uh, because we've talked about um, many things in this lecture already. Um, in terms of references, so first uh, for the second half, uh, again, 
if you want to read more about policy learning uh, than uh, this kind of cursory introduction I gave here, um, uh, you can, I'd recommend first starting uh, from this paper by Hitagawa and Tetanov. Uh, they set up the problem very nicely and they propose uh, the IPW uh, based estimator there. And then uh, what we do in this paper is uh, we kind of uh, propose the, the double robust um, policy learning estimator um, and I propose to study uh, that estimator. Uh, also, if you want to read more about the gain application uh, and, and policy learning, then, then we talk about that in detail um, here. Um, in terms of the first half of the lecture, uh, so that is uh, robust loss functions for estimating tau of x itself. Um, the presentation today uh, followed most closely um, uh, this uh, biometric forthcoming paper, um, where in particular the examples I showed about, um, say, stacking uh, BART and causal force. They're taken from there if you want to learn more. Uh, so this is kind of this paper outlines uh, the, the, the methodology for the R learner and has some uh, kind of preliminary formal results. Uh, but more recently, uh, there's a paper, there's a pair of papers that has kind of gone much deeper into this, proving much more general and also more powerful uh, results about R learner type estimators. Um, so the two here are this paper by. Uh, Faster and Zerganis, and the other is by uh, Kennedy. So again, if you're interested in theory for this kind of stuff, uh, these are two uh, very nice papers to read. 